So as mentioned, this isn't original research. This is something that has uh, already appeared in uh, a, a bunch of literature. But it's something that, that I found really interesting, and, it's, and so as a result, I want to tell you guys about it. Um, so we'll start with the story, the year, 430 BC, uh, location, Athens. There's a major plague, and so as a response, the citizens send a delegation to the temple of Apollos and Delos to um, ask for help to their gods. And so when they arrive, they talk to the, to the priest, and their, the response is that they have to take the altar that's there at the temple and double it in size. Um, and so just note that the altar is a cube shaped. And so the idea is that they're trying to double a cube in size. Um, so the first attempt is literally just more or less put two next to each other, right? Um, and so we can see here that if we use the, the uh, equation to find volume, that this is indeed double the cube, right? But the problem was that this construction isn't as visually pleasing as a cube, right? Because now you have a, rect or a rectangular prism. Um, and so that, that didn't work. So in desperation, what they did was uh, double the length of each of the sides. But there's a problem with this, right? Because if we use the uh, equation to find volume of a cube, we find that this is eight times the size of the original cube. OK, so more or less what happened is they weren't able to solve this challenge puzzle. And so the play continued, unfortunately. Um, but let's say we were in that situation, right? Let's say that, I guess, city-state of Grand Rapids uh, had this predicament, and we had to, uh, for some reason, go to a temple and you know, try, to, try, try the same challenge. Um, what is this? How would we attempt this? Um, so again, given a cube with unit length, and I just say unit length because ultimately it won't matter, um, can we construct another cube with double the volume of the original. And so what this means is here we have a volume with unit uh, length, and as a result, the volume is just one again. Um, and we want to double that, right? And so if we use, again, the, the equation for the volume of the cube, we find that we would have to be able to construct a side length of cube root of two. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking this uh, problem and transforming it into a geometric construction problem. And so to more formally define a construction, a construction is a finite sequence of fundamental constructions with a compass, with a compass and an unmarked straight edge. Um, and here I'll present the constructions. So given two points, we can draw a line through them. Given two points, we can draw a line segment through them. And then given, given a point and a line segment, we can draw a circle with the center at a point and the radius equal to the length of the segment. Uh, so visually, what that means is the first one here, we have two, two dots, two points, and we can draw a line through them to, with our straight edge. Uh, likewise, the segment is a similar argument. And then at the end, given a segment length and uh, a point, we can draw a circle with uh, the center at that point and the radius being the length of that segment using our compass. Um, and then just to emphasize the, the sequence portion, it just means that, for example, once we have this line, we can build off of that line by doing other fundamental constructions. And each one of those steps would be one part of the sequence. Right. So we have a compass. 
an unmarked straight edge, and a unit length. Um, I claim that we can construct sums and differences. Um, so what we can do here is, again, given unit length, some segment A and B that we've already constructed, we can construct the sum in this fashion. So the idea is here, we begin by constructing uh, segment A. And since we can draw a line through that, we can also, from this point, construct a segment B. And I won't go into the details of how exactly you do it, but just know that you can. Um, and a similar argument holds for the differences. So we just want to make sure that we begin by constructing first our longest distance, or yeah, our longest segment, and then constructing our smallest segment on top of that. And we find that the remaining bit is our difference. Uh, similarly, we can construct uh, products and quotients. Uh, these are a little bit more involved, so I'll go ahead and demonstrate it. But the idea is that if you start with a point, and then you draw two, two rays that are non-collinear, in other words, they don't form a straight line, then you can construct segment A somewhere right here. And then your unit length as well as segment B somewhere over here. So this would be B. And then what we want to do is draw this segment here so that we have a triangle. And then we want to draw a parallel here with that line. And so now we have two similar triangles. And we can find that uh, by the rule, the ratios of similar, similar triangles, we can find that uh, this segment here is the product of, the, of A and B. And a similar argument for the quotients, uh, the difference is that we start by constructing this segment A, then going to segment B, our unit length here. Um, but then first we draw this bottom segment first, and then we go to making this top segment as being parallel to the bottom one, and finding that the smaller segment is the quotient of the two um, segments, A and B. Right. So are these it? Like, Can we construct more things other than sums, differences, products, and quotients? Um, there's more. I'll proceed with an example. So if we take uh, our unit length and then construct another segment that's uh, two times the uh, unit length, then we can bisect this segment. And from there, we identify a circle. And then from our point here, we can draw a perpendicular. And the claim is that this line is the square root of 2. And so uh, using our tools, we can construct the square root of 2. Um, but the thing is, the use of the segment length 2 isn't all too special. right? We can just put some number there. And so as a result, we can construct the square root of some integer or uh, rational number there. So there's more, right? Things that we can construct. Um, so with that, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about algebra a little bit. Um, and so in, in the field of algebra, there are these things called fields. And the, a, a field is a set together with two binary operations. Uh, for our purposes, it's going to be not division, addition and multiplication uh, with the following properties. And I'll illustrate the properties with an example. So if we look at the set of rational numbers, if we add two rational numbers, we get another rational number. So this is called closure of addition. 
If we multiply two rational numbers, we get another rational number, and that's the closure of multiplication. Um, the set has additive and multiplicative identities, and what that means is if you take some rational number and add the number 0, it doesn't change it, right? You, get, you still have that same number. If you have some number, some rational number, and you multiply by 1, you still have that same rational number. Um, and so we say that 0 is the additive identity, and 1 is the multiplicative identity. Um, and then we also have inverses. Um, and basically what that means is that given some number, rational number, we can add some other number to get the additive identity. And likewise, if we have a, num a non-zero number, we can multiply by its inverse to get the multiplicative identity. Um, we have this the associativity property, which means that if you're adding three things together, if you add the first two things and then add a third one, it's the same as adding the last two things and then adding the first one. Um, and the same thing for multiplication applies. Um, we have the distributed property that tells us that if we have the sum of two numbers and we want to multiply by another one, it's the same as taking that first value, multiplying it by each term, and then adding those terms together. And we, lastly, we have uh, commutativity, which means that we can add two rational numbers in any order. And it'd be the same, the same thing. Uh, and the same thing for multiplication. We can take two numbers, multiply them, a, b, and get, and we find that b, a is also the same thing. Right, so, so this is a field. And so how does this help us? Um, I'm going to make some claims, right? So I say that the set of rational numbers together with addition and multiplication form a field. Um, likewise, uh, I'm going to claim that the set of real numbers together with addition and multiplication form a field. And also that if we knew what all the constructible numbers were, all the constructible lengths, then if we use the same addition and multiplication defined on these two sets, then we can show that uh, this set of constructible numbers with those two operations is a field. And so to do so, we showed that we can construct sums, differences, uh, products, and quotients. So that, so that more or less shows this property um, this property, this property, and right, so those two. So we would have to show these three properties to fully prove that the constructible numbers are a field, right? So, but for now, we're not going to prove that. We're just going to get right into what uh, is going to help us. So here's another idea. If we have a field, um, we say that a quadratic extension of a constructible set F is this set with the condition that square root of k is not in your original field F. Um, and we say that it's F adjoin root k. And so as an example, if we look at the rational numbers with uh, the two operations defined, then we know that uh, square or no, the number 2 is a rational number. It can be expressed as 2 divided by 1. But we also know, or maybe we don't know, but I claim that square root of 2 is not a rational number. So it's not in our set. So then we can talk about this adjoining <coughs> square root of 2 to the rationals to create this new field. Um, but the main idea I want you to take from this is that imagine you had 
like an infinite container where you can stuff all the rational numbers, and you have in your hand the square root of 2, and you just throw it in there, right? You want this to be a bigger field, but because you need to meet all those requirements of um, the, the closure requirements, you have to say that not only a square root of 2 in that new set, but also the sum of square root of 2 and those other numbers already in the set. So for example, things like 10 plus or, or plus the square root of 2 would be a number in that new field. Uh, products, for example, 5 times the root 2 would be a new element in that field. And so the idea here, again, is that you take a field and you throw a number in there that's not already in there to make a slightly bigger field. And that's what a quadratic extension is, or at least in, in terms here. OK. So then skipping again to another idea. Uh, so here, this is going to help us answer our problem. So we can say that a number is constructible if there exists a finite sequence of field of fields, so that each, each successive one is a quadratic extension from the last. And so that's really wordy, but more or less what it means is that if we start with the rationals and then do that thing I mentioned earlier with throwing in the square root of 2 to, to make this slightly larger field, we can keep doing that. So next we can throw in the square root of 3 and seeing what field that becomes. And so this thing here, this is the sequence that I'm talking about. And as a result, um, we have 9 plus the root 6 can be written as this. And notice that each, each of these individual numbers are in, so for example, 9 is rational, so it's in here. Root 3 uh, is in here. And then root 2 is in this field. So we know that since this is in this field, because its individual components are in one of these fields, then by this theorem, this number is constructible. Right. So then, for this lemma, if we have some field extension, doesn't matter what it is, uh, of some field f, if the cube root of 2 is in this extension, then we know that it has to be in the previous extension. And so what that means is, um, right, so if, if the cube root of 2 is in this, then it has to be in this field. And so I won't go through the proof, but this is where we go, OK, what about our challenge, right? Like, where are we heading with this? Um, how does this help, if at all? Um, so right, can we save ourselves, right? Because we're in the situation where we're currently in Grand Rapids. Um, and so to answer that, I say that we're kind of doomed. <laughs> I, I claim that it's not possible to construct the length cube root of 2. So why? Let's assume that we can. So this will be a proof by contradiction. So assume we can. Uh, by our constructability theorem, we know that there exists a sequence of field extensions, each one a quadratic extension of the last. right? And then we're assuming that, since it is constructible, that the cube root of 2 is in that very last field extension that we have. right? So then by our previous lemma, if it's in that field extension, then it must also be in its previous field. right? And then by repeating the lemma again, it must be in the previous one. right? And then repeating the lemma again, uh, we reach a contradiction. And the contradiction is that 
Uh, even though I didn't actually prove it, cube root of 2 is not a rational number. And so that's where we, we can say that this is absurd. And, and so it must be true that, that our theorem statement is correct. Right. So then, right, so it's not possible to, to double the cube. Um, so what does this mean, right? So this is a really specific, I talk about field extensions, or specifically quadratic extensions, and that helps solve this, solve this very specific problem. Um, but the idea here can be generalized. So instead of talking about quadratic extensions, we can talk about uh, radical extensions, which change, changes the notation a little bit, but it's more or less the same idea. Uh, let's say you have like the nth root of some number. Then you can create bigger and bigger field, fields by throwing those numbers in, right? And so this idea of field extensions, quadratic extension, all these different terms I'm throwing at you, is one part of the proof that says that if you have a polynomial of degree 5 or greater, you cannot fi find a solution by radicals. Um, and so what that means in terms of this is that uh, if you have, if we can solve a polynomial by radicals, it means that we can find a sequence of uh, radical extensions from some base field, or in other words, some starting field. And then we can take that idea and um, look into a different field of mathematics called uh, group theory, which I won't talk about here, but um, combined uh, produces the result that uh, a solution by radicals for degree 5 and greater polynomials is not does not exist. Um, right. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then lastly, I, I should probably thank my, <laughs> my mentor, Dr. Steven Schlicker, uh, the mathematics department, uh, since this was a part of a independent study. Uh, the math department here at Grand Rapids Community College for allowing me to give this talk, and of course to all of you for coming. Um, I very much appreciate that. Um, and here are my two primary sources. And I made this talk short because there's probably going to be a lot of questions, and I'd rather answer individual questions than trying to fit all the details into one presentation. <laughs> well, I have a question. Sure, please. Um, I'm not really into math as much as these people, but I did in, in my early days. But if there were a carpenter who was given this task, he would say, of course I could build something that's twice the volume. But you wouldn't, it wouldn't be exactly twice the volume. Is, is that pretty much what the answer is? Yeah, exactly. So going back to the story, right? Uh, there were some constructions that were made that more or less doubled, uh, but because they weren't, the constructions weren't by ideal geometrical methods, uh, that's why it didn't count. Um, and so I guess that would have been a good point to make in the beginning as a, a third attempt, so to speak. Um, but yeah, you have a very good point. And the idea here is that when we talk about being able to construct uh, a length, uh, it's more or less in terms of, given only a restricted amount of tools, can we do it? Um, but yes, you're right. There are some unperfect, quote unquote, constructions out there that, that allow you to double the cube. And I guess if we could do it, then we would be a god ourselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I would imagine that's the whole idea of, if you can do this, then the play will be gone because you can't, so, okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes? Uh, so I think I might have missed something. Could you go 
go back to the slide where you're describing the theorem? If something, if an element is in the quadratic ex extension, then it has to be in the original field. Um, I think it's back one more. Yeah, this, this one's it. Oh, this is it? Yeah, it's the, the top portion. Okay. Top portion. Could you explain this? Cause yeah. Uh, the proof or just the idea? The. <laughs> <laughs> wrapping my mind around if something is in an extension, so stuff added on, then it has to be, then that itself has to be in the original field? Yeah, so I'm saying if, yeah, so I guess to, to best answer your question, the idea here is that we're starting with, with this initial assumption. And with a very clever algebraic argument, we can show that it would have to be in the previous. Um, but if you look at the um, definition of a field or a quadratic extension, it wouldn't make entirely sense unless, hmm, I guess that's a good question. <laughs> uh, right, because you have some field that has some number of elements, right, with some condition. And then we're saying that if we extend it by something, then you have something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so then if some number x was here, then oh right okay so let's say let's say this was the rationals and then the extension was by like root 2 mm -hmm. uh, we know that like any any rational number say 5 or 6 is in the new extension right as a, by definition so then it must be in the previous so the idea here is that if you start with this claim at the beginning, uh, even if we don't know that root 2 is irrational, um, if we can make an argument of why it has to be in the previous extension, um, then that's all we really care about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, because our initial field, we're not saying it's the rationals. We're just saying that it's some field. Yeah, so that's the idea there. Caught me off guard. <laughs> it's fine. Any more questions? Yes. Could you go to your, your next slide where you kind of finished this uh, proof? So in this, you're, you're doing a proof by contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're arriving at is because the cube root of 2 is not rational, it's not constructible, right? It's, uh, it's purely a. Uh, the fact, yeah, that it's not rational. Okay. Yep. So, can we use the same argument for the square root of two? Um, basically, just replacing this and saying the square root of two is not rational, so it is not constructible. But we showed that it was constructible. Let's see. Can't help you on this oh, okay, okay, yeah. So this this kind of this kind of get gets at this lemma, right? Um, and I should have brought my book because it would have been easy to reference. But um, the way that this lemma is, is proved is that you say that uh, the cube root of two is the root of some of a very specific cubic polynomial, which we know is. Uh, x cubed minus two. minus two. Yep. Why did I draw a blank? Um, and then we use that to make an argument of why it has to be an f. But um, if I remember correctly, the same argument that gets used fails for square root of two. If I remember correctly, um, it wouldn't work. But my short answer is, it relies a lot on how this specific Lemma's proof is constructed, not so much as whether the um, any number is in a field and as a result in its previous extension. Okay. 
Yeah. I think what really is at heart here is that Hubert Fu is just a different animal than the square is the future extension. And what the lemma, and I'm going to be perfectly honest, I I've not seen this exact lemma before, but my, my thinking is because you have the cube root of two and you're using a field extension with the square root of k, it, you're not going to be able to get the cube root of two to be, it, it's if cube root of two is in that extension. Okay. Well, if yeah. it is, then there's some way of representing the cube root of two using those square roots using your field properties. And since that's not going to happen, you're going to be okay. That's my thinking. So I guess what I'm getting at is it has to do with the specific nature of Q root versus square root. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, if we were to construct a field that contains Q root of 2, we would need it to um, look like, so like, let's say we do the rationals and then adjoin the Q root of 2. Then it would have to look like this. I'm running out of space, but right. So it would it would have to be uh, not just the cube root of two, but also its square, because if we don't include the square, we we can we find that we don't have the nice closure properties, um, and so that that also plays into what John was saying is that um, it's more or less a different animal in terms of what that means for the previous extension, or the previous field. So no matter what we do, pretty much, we can't tame it in terms of the square root of 2. Yeah. Yep. So then if a construction was found to be able to cube root something, this would be possible. But until that's found, it is not. Can you repeat that again? I, I, I'm a little. So we, the reason why we're allowed to use square root is because we found a construction that can find the square root of a number. Mm -hmm. So because we don't have a geometric construction that will give us a cube root, we can't rely on the square root. So that's what makes it impossible. Seems reasonable. I can't speak to that, to be honest. Well, well that begs the next question. How do we know that the, the straight line and, and compass produce only uh, quadratic extensions and not any other kind of extension? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Which is, leads to what you were saying. It's an extension of what you were saying because we don't have a construction. Yeah. That's why. We, so we have to prove that this straight edge and the compass can only do quadratic extensions of fields and not nothing else. Hmm. Interesting. Nice. Yeah, right? <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. I don't mean to keep grilling you. No, not at all. Uh, you had referred to um, we know that uh, anything degree five and above uh, cannot be solved with, with any kind of radicals or things mm -hmm. like that. There's no formula, like a quadratic formula, for doing that. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on how this relates to that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I will admit I didn't actually solve this, but lucky for me, uh, my classmate uh, had better luck with this. But the idea is that uh, so most of us maybe know the quadratic equation formula uh, for finding out what the roots of a quadratic polynomial is. Um, and so you can do this idea of um, field extensions to more or less get the same result. Um, and so the idea then is if you could do the same for a larger polynomial, then you, can, then you should be able to solve it, right, for degree five or bigger. Um, but that's not possible. And I wish I could say more, but 
that also gets into this idea of group theory, which I guess, to put it simply, would be if you have a, a set, say the rationals, well, maybe not the rationals, but if you have a set and you define one specific binary operation, maybe that's addition or multiplication. Usually addition works very nicely, but it doesn't have to be addition. Um, and so you have this, you can say, a restricted version of a field. And then you can define what it means to solve uh, a group. And then once you have that, um, it, it more or less is the same idea of like you find a sequence of uh, subgroups. And then with this uh, theorem that I didn't mention anywhere on here, you can make a correspondence between the field extensions and these uh, subgroups. And so you can transform a question of, can we solve for this degree polynomial um, into, can we solve this associated group? And then once you have that, and you can solve for that group, then you can just translate it back into what you want, and then show that it more or less is, is or isn't possible, depending on what you find over here with your groups. So that's really hand wavy. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of algebra involved, but, but that's the idea there of you can't uh, solve degree five or greater, or there doesn't exist a, an equation or you know, by radicals for degree five or greater. Yeah? Fun stuff. Any more questions? We're just too stupid today. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about mathematics is anything that's interesting and it leads to more questions. There aren't many people that know the answers to all those questions. I, I applaud the fact that you'd open it up to questions, some of which you must have figured you weren't going to be able to answer. <laughs> no, it's, but it's, it's true. It takes courage to yeah. do that because it's, it's easy to get up and say, well, I'll do this. And then, well, we don't have time for questions now. <laughs> so that was, it was nice of you to do that. And yeah, I mean, if you're going to talk about anything of substance in mathematics, there will always be more questions, and the good questions don't necessarily have short, simple answers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.